Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order Monday, April the 7th at 7.02 p.m. And certainly want to welcome all of you that are in attendance with us, with us this evening. Um, before I begin, I've been asked to, to announce that DTV8 is now Durham Television Network instead of DTV8 is now DTN, I guess, a Durham Television Network. Uh, the name changes because DTN is now available on Time Warner Cable and AT&T U-verse. Uh, it's on channel 97.5 or either channel 8 on Time's Warner Cable, depending on if you have a digital cable box. DTN is on AT&T U-verse on channel 99. Uh, this meeting has been televised and monitors to your left and to my right. We show you the broadcast signal. The monitors behind the council will show you what we are seeing. And lastly, this meeting will be replayed Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights at 9 p.m. and Fridays at 2 p.m. That's a public announcement by our public affairs office. Uh, if we could just take a moment of silent meditation, please. Thank you. I ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge. All right. Ask the clerk if she would call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Council Member Brown. Here. Council Member Katati. Here. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Moffitt. Here. And Council Member Shaw. Here. We have uh, several resolutions and recognitions to present tonight and the first, this is really a delight, I'd like to recognize Miss Betty Kloss. And I'm going to ask Betty if she will come and join me along with her. Of course, her father's taking pictures. I don't know if he can. <laughs> mother. mother can join. Okay. Oh, it's good for her to sit right here. So, so she's up high. How are you doing? Okay. Uh, some of you probably know that. Uh, Ms. Kloss, who was a fifth grader from Little River Elementary School, and as such has become the first African American regional spelling bee champion. And we need to applause her for that. <laughs> we had uh, originally planned to recognize uh, Ms. Kloss early, soon after she had uh, won the spelling bee. Uh, Dr. Phil Wynn from Duke University, I don't know, Phil, if you want to join us or not, uh, was his, his department sponsored to be, and he notified us soon thereafter that Ms. Claus had won, and we immediately invited her to be at our city council meeting. But uh, you know, we've had some weird weather uh, this, this past year, and unfortunately, the weather prevented her from, from coming. But uh, she's here tonight, and we, we're here to recognize her. Uh, as I understand it, there were 59 spellers representing schools across Durham and Orange Counties that took to the stage to compete in the fifth annual Duke Regional Spelling Bee, which was he held in Page Auditorium on Duke University's campus. And the spelling bee kicked off with the word hamster and continued for three hours and 25 rounds. Uh, the final three spellers were Betty Kloss, a Little River Elementary School fifth grader, and the 2013 regional bee runner-up, Olivia Fujikawa, a sixth grade at Lakewood Montessori Middle School, who has appeared three times at the regional bee, and Ned Swanson, a Brogdon Middle School sixth grader, and a 2012 regional bee winner. And as you can imagine, with uh, three finalists, the, the crowd really waited anxiously for the final word. And Ms. Claus smelled with relief what she heard and I'm going to ask her to spell it again. <laughs> the word was impunity. Mm -hmm. 
Impunity. I M P U N I T Y. Impunity. All right. And I can tell you, we're very proud to have uh, Betty represent the city of Durham as she goes off to participate in the Strips National Spelling Bee in Washington. I think that's in May of this, this, this year. So uh, we certainly wish you the best. You've already made us proud, and we know you do your best as you go forth. And come back and tell us what the winning word is, and we'll have you spell it again here at Durham City Council. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Claus if she has any comments you might want to make. Uh, I'm really proud to be representing Durham in the Scripps National Spelling Bee. I know I'm going to do very well in the National because I have plenty of support from all my school and my family and my friends, and I just know I'm going to do really well. Dr. Wynn. And I'm going to let um, Betty introduce her mother and her sister, if you don't mind. And I, her father, if he can get away from those cameras, can come up also willing. Go ahead. Um, this is my mom. She's been helping me a lot with my spelling and my sister who's been really supportive and my dad who just did like a lot of tasks in between like making the food and stuff. <laughs> well, we wish you the best and when you come back, we're gonna just spell that word to win on, okay? <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. I should have recognized a, a good friend, an old friend, Bert Collins, a former president of North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, and his wife. Uh, the next is a resolution memorializing Ferdinand Vincent F. E. Pete Allison, Jr. And I'm going to ask, I see Lavonne, you see, I thought I saw the whole family, if you, you mind joining me, if you don't mind. This is Lavonia Allison, <laughs> who just reminded me that she has a couple of precinct people from her uh, <laughs> precinct that are present. So that's important precinct fortitude. Nothing has changed, Mr. Mayor. Nothing at all. <laughs> but seriously, I, I think it's probably not a person in this room that doesn't know Pete or has had some type of involvement uh, during their time here in Durham. Certainly, I have, and. Uh, I refer to Pete as the general but quiet giant behind Lavonia Allison, Dr. Lavonia Allison, okay. But Pete was a great, good, a good friend of so many people and uh, did so much for this community and we were, knew he had been in ill health for uh, some period of time and I, I remember the last time that I saw him, uh, the rest of him, he was still in good spirits and he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna get himself together. But uh, unfortunately, uh, he passed and there was a memorial service for him and uh, I had an opportunity to be a part of that, but more importantly, uh, we have a resolution memorializing Ferdinand Vincent F.V. Pete Allison, Jr. And I, I won't read all of this, but it speaks to the fact that whereas Ferdinand Vincent F.V. Pete Allison, Jr., the only son of Ferdinand Vincent Allison, Sr., and Elizabeth R. Allison was born January 15, 1923, in Greensville County, Virginia, and grew up in Emporio. And whereas Mr. Allison served in the United States Army Corps, Air Corps during World War II, and afterwards returned to Hampton, Virginia, earning his Bachelor of Science degree in 1948 from Hampton Institute, now known as Hampton University, and later a Master's in Business Administration from New York University in 1952. 
And upon graduation, Mr. Allison traveled to Durham, North Carolina, and during this trip met former Mutual Savings and Loan Association President John S. Shag Stewart. And such a meeting resulted in a job offer as a teller and bookkeeper in 1953, and later evolved into an extraordinary career in the banking industry from 1978 to 1996, serving as President, Chief Executive Officer, and Chairman of the Board of Directors of Mutual Community Savings Bank, Inc., SSB. Whereas during Mr. Allison's tenure with Mutual Savings and Loan, he was instrumental in transitioning the institution from a savings and loan to a mutual savings bank and later a stock company in 1993. In addition, he initiated the acquisition of two smaller banks in 1995, American Federal Savings and Loan and Greensboro National Bank. Whereas Mr. Allison was a stronghold in the Durham community for over 61 years, having enriched the lives of others through his service and involvement with organizations, and I won't name all the organizations, but one is the Durham Community Affairs of Black People, and whereas Mr. Allison was honored on numerous occasions for his unselfish work and contributions to the community, having been inducted into the North Carolina Banking Hall of Fame in 2013, recipient of the Longleaf Pine presented by Governor Jim Hunt, Mechanics and Farmers Bank Founders Award in 2010, honoree of the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, active in national and state business organizations such as the American League of Financial Institutions, the National Business League, U.S. League of Savings Institution Board of Directors, the North Carolina Education Association and Authority, and also the RDU Airport. His life not only impacted the banking world, but his strong political skills earned him great respect from city, county, and state leaders as he served on various advisory boards. Where his family was very important to Ms. Allison, and he was especially proud of his merit for 59 years to Dr. E. Livonia Ingram Allison, also a longtime member and the head of the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People, and blessed with two children, Michelle Allison Davis, Dr. Ferdinand Vincent Allison III, and four grandchildren, Christopher, Brian, Curtis, and Melissa. And whereas Mr. Allison was a life member of the NAACP, member of Beta Phi, Beta Phi Chapter of Mega Psi Phi Fraternity, AS Hunter Lodge Number 825 of Free and Accepted Masons of North Carolina, Prince Hall Affiliation Sar Archon of Alpha Tau Boule Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity, Inc., and whereas he was a faithful member of White Rock, ba White Rock Baptist Church, where he served as trustee and chairperson of the Budget Committee. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Durham City Council, one, that this council pauses in a moment of silence in memory of Ferdinand Vincent F. V. Pete Allison, Jr. And two, that the City Council honor his vast contribution to the banking industry and his leadership, dedication, and service to the community. Three, that this resolution be spread upon the official minutes of this governing body. And four, that a certified copy of this resolution be presented to his wife, Dr. E. Livonia Ingram Allison, I. D. Andre, duly appointed City Clerk of the Durham, City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby certify that the above resolution Number 9887 is a true and accurate copy adopted by the Durham City Council on March the 17th, 2014. And with my hand, the Corporate Seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 7th day of April, 2014, and is signed by me as your mayor and DeAndre, the city clerk. And I'm going to present this to Livonia for any comments and to the rest of the family. On behalf of um, K. Michelle Allison, F. Vincent III, a cousin that's originally from Richmond County, uh, and other friends here, I have a couple of people from Precinct 42 that have looked after me during the time that Pete has been very ill. Would you all stand? I think the chair of the political committee for the Durham Committee is out there. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> you know, the neighborhood makes a real difference. And these are the persons that when I have to call on someone to, Pete had been sick, very sick for a long time. And they have been making it possible uh, for us to continue to do some things for the community. But Pete Allison uh, was, the reason that I was already out there, I couldn't have been out there without a husband like him. And everybody knows that. And it's a long story, but the first year 
that we were married, and I'm not going to take long to tell that, but I got involved because every second and fourth Thursday, he was leaving home. First year we were married, I said, what in the world is going on? And I found out that that was a regular meeting of an organization. Back there then, if you came to Durham, you showed up, and you were there, and you worked. So basically, I, one night I said, well, look, I have got to go with you because I don't believe y'all meeting like this. <laughs> <laughs> and believe it or not, they let me in, and Mr. Wheeler became a mentor. And so then Pete said, well, she's in there. She might as well, whatever, work hard. <laughs> But I really want to thank this city council because Pete really loved, loved Durham. One more story is that when he came to Durham and passed Beechwood Cemetery, he tells us all the time that he was so proud to see a cemetery that looked so good and clean and beautiful. And he said that could be anybody buried there. You couldn't tell that it was a black colored cemetery, and that's something for Durham. But let's see if we can, in fact, make his legacy even more proud, because he loved this city. And he told it from the time he was in Washington with his nephews, or when he was in NYU with friends who went to school with him at Hampton, or when he was in Durham. He had these very, very positive stories about Durham. And so I want to thank you on behalf of our friends in 31 streets in Precinct 42, for my family, and for all the people who are going to come out to vote. Thank you so very much for this wonderful resolution. For the man that I love dearly, and I know he loved me dearly. Thank you so much. So Laura Benson, she would join me, please. This is a um, resolution recognizing the week of the young child, and Laura is the executive director for Durham's Partnership for Children. The resolution speaks to the fact that Durham Partnership for Children, Child Care Services Association, and other local collaborating organizations are celebrating the week of the young child under the national theme of early years are learning years, whereas organizations improve early learning opportunities, which are crucial to the growth and development of young children and to support the school readiness of our youngest children, whereas making sure children are ready to learn is a community endeavor that involves parents, child care providers, policy makers, businesses, congregations, and community agencies, whereas transition to kindergarten must be a smooth, coordinated process for children parents and schools that greatly minimizes the achievement gap, whereas early care and education is economic development strategy at the beginning of the talent pipeline workforce based on research that children with early learning successes are more likely to finish school, more likely to attend college, and more likely to be employed, whereas high quality early care supports Durham's current workforce for families with young children who rely on child care to work and for employers who know that stable child care reduces their employees' absenteeism and turnover whereas comprehensive bilingual evidence-based programs in parent education, health, and literacy increases family stability, whereas early intervention, family support, and education can help break the cycle of poverty that affects more than half of Durham's children and create opportunities in early childhood that have a lasting impact in the community, whereas the Durham City Council do hereby proudly recognize that early years are learning years and that the ages of birth to five are the most critical time in children's development which builds the foundation for success in school and life. And therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim April 6 to April 12, 2014, as the week of the young child in Durham, and hereby recognize Durham's Partnership for Children and Child Care Services Association for the exemplary model of collaboration, which continues to improve the landscape of early education for Durham residents and benefits present and future generations. And witness my hand, Corporate City of Durham, 
North Carolina. This is the seventh day of April, 2014. I'm going to present this to Laura, but I, I just want to say when she, before she makes the comments, uh, probably most of you know that we, we're embarking on this challenge of trying to reduce poverty in neighborhood by neighborhood, year by year, starting in 2014. And a very important part of that is looking at the issue of education. And I, I'm convinced, and I'm sure most people are convinced, that this bit about pre-K education has a very, very valuable impact on young child's lives. So I just hope at some point in time that we as a community can come together and really get behind this pre-K piece, uh, work with our boards of education, and more importantly, work with people in general assembly who fund a lot of this stuff so we can get, get this ball really rolling in, in our community. But I'm gonna turn this over to Laura and uh, thank her for the work that she provides and the leadership provides in this area also. Thank you. Durham's Partnership for Children is your Smart Start agency. And Child Care Services Association is your local resource and referral organization. On behalf of our staff, including Colby Falconer, who's with me from CCSA today, our boards of directors, we thank you for this proclamation. Early educators should really be called brain builders or crime prevention officers or national security specialists. We are economic development engines. And on behalf of all early educators in our community, we thank you for celebrating the Week of the Young Child. I hope you saw this morning's op-ed in the Herald Sun, written by our board vice chair, Daniel Robinson, who is developing several projects here in concert with you at the city. He wrote eloquently about the economic rationale of investing in young children. Now, with our shared attention to eradicating poverty, as you so eloquently stated, Mayor Bell, we can unite around strategies that buffer children from the impact of toxic stress, which is symptomatic of growing up in low-income households. We can expand access to high-quality child care. We can support parents as their child's first and most important teachers. And we can optimize health and well-being for young children by fighting obesity, improving dental health, and we can move forward with that vision of expanding pre-K. As our city leadership, you serve far beyond these walls, as you well know. You guide our work, and you make a difference for young children. Our collaborations and mutual accountabilities run deep, and I wanted to take a moment to illuminate all of the people on behalf of the city who serve in the partnerships venue. Mayor Bell, you're a recipient of our Community Builder Award last year. You're a dedicated advocate for young children. And as soon as tomorrow morning, you'll be reading to three and four-year-olds at another beautiful beginning, a five-star, high-quality child care center on Anger Avenue that is in the neighborhood that you have prioritized for your poverty eradication initiative. City Manager Bonfield and all of the city council and staff you prioritize young children in so many ways in your daily work. On our board, Rhonda Parker serves capably. Amy Blaylock is on our Community Awareness Committee using her communications and public awareness expertise to guide us. Toya Merritt sits on our Evaluation Committee. She helps measure the impact of our programs and considers how we can make the best community investments. Nick Allen is a brand new member of our Allocations Committee. He, along with others, is responsible for making decisions recommended to our board to invest millions of dollars for children in this community, birth to five. There are only 2,000 days between the time a child is born and the time that child enters kindergarten. The needs are urgent, and you make all the difference in those 2,000 days. So in celebration of the Week of the Young Child, we invite you to see our great display at Northgate Mall. Mark your calendars for the next Early Childhood Bus Tour, which several of you have already taken on May 14th. That bus tour is now sponsored by Mechanics and Farmers Bank, and we're very pleased for that sponsorship throughout this coming year. And we also want to be sure that you attend our School Readiness Summit co-presented with Durham Public Schools on July the 21st at the Durham Convention Center. There's more material in these packets that I've prepared for you. And let me not leave this evening without saying that I was 
in the trail of Councilman Shule at the 10K at the Great Human Race. So I stand in awe of your great prowess on the racetrack. And again, thank you for this proclamation and for your ongoing support of investing in the lives of young children and their families. I'd like to ask Lieutenant April Brownie from Durham City Police Department to join me. Uh, this is in recognition of Na National Crime Victims' Rights Week proclamation. Whereas Americans are victims of more than 22 million crimes each year, and these crimes also affect family members, friends, neighbors, and coworkers, Whereas crime can leave a lasting physical, emotional, or financial impact on people of all ages and abilities, and of all economic, racial, and social backgrounds. And whereas in 1984, the Crime Victims Fund was established by the Victims of Crime Act, known as VOCA, to provide a permanent source of support for crime victim services and compensation through fines and penalties paid by convicted federal offenders, whereas by ensuring that federal offender crime, criminal fines and penalties are deposited and to the Crime Victims Fund, Congress affirmed that those who commit crimes should be held accountable for the impact of their actions. Whereas formation of the Durham Police Department Victim Services Unit in 1997 was a pivotal milestone in positioning the agency to better implement and advocate for services that reinforce victims' rights. Whereas through its Victim Services Unit, the Durham Police Department has made significant strides over the past 16 years, providing comprehensive services to crime victims, whereas the victim assistance community faces new challenges to reach and serve all victims, including victims of newly recognized crimes, such as domestic human trafficking of children and cybercrime, and victims who have not always trusted the criminal justice system, including immigrant victims, urban youth, and victims who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, whereas now is the time to embrace a new emphasis on learning what works and reaching underserved victims and meeting victims' needs, Whereas National Crime Victims' Right Week, April 6th through 12th, 2014, provides an opportunity to celebrate the energy, creativity, and commitment that launched the Victims' Rights Movement, inspired its progress, and continues to advance the causes of justice for crime victims, whereas the City of Durham Police Department is joining forces with victim service providers, criminal justice agencies, and concerned citizens throughout Durham, North Carolina, in America to raise awareness of victims' rights and observe National Crime Victims' Rights Week. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, I do hereby proclaim the week of April 6th through 12th, 2014, as National Crime Victims' Rights Week in Durham, and reaffirm the City of Durham's commitment to respect and enforce victims' rights and address victims' needs during National Crime Victims' Rights Week and throughout the year, and express our appreciation for those victims and crime survivors who have turned personal tragedy into a motivating force to improve our response to victims of crime and build a more just community. What's my hand this day, April the 7th, and I'll turn this over to April for any comments. Thank you. First, I would like to thank Mayor Bell and the council and the city administrators for the opportunity to bring awareness to National Crimes Victims Right Week. I particularly would like to thank Mayor Pro Tem McFadden and Councilman Shule for showing up at the banquet. I meant a lot to the staff and as well as the attendees. I would also now like to acknowledge the Victim Service Unit. Could you please stand? At this time, I would like to just give a little explanation about what the unit actually does because some people don't really know. They do quite a lot, and this is just a tad bit of what they do. Um, first, they, are, they take the assigned caseload that's pulled on a daily basis. They look at the type of contact that needs to be made to determine um, by reviewing the case details entered in by responding officer and case investigators. Once the needs of the victim is determined, then they make contact with the victim to offer their services. Um, by making contact with each victim, they can either do it by telephone, in person, or by mail. Once they have the victim's cooperation, they'll make um, the appropriate local and state agencies to coordinate the services that they need. And there are just a few that I'll name for now. 
Um, they've got something, it's, it's the um, trauma response uh, at crime scenes. They can also coordinate emergency shelter, provide safety planning, coordinate counseling services. They can also coordinate medical examinations, court accompaniment, and assist in case update. That's just to name a few of the things that they do. The unit does quite a bit and quite a lot, and they are appreciated by the Durham Police Department, especially the Community Service Bureau, and I happen to be the lieutenant over that, assistant district commander. Um, and I wanna say thank you for this proclamation. This really is very important for us to recognize that you know, people are victims of crime and that they do need the assistance by this victims, or this victims' rights unit. And I wanna say thank you again. Uh, the next proclamation speaks to the issue of Fair Housing Month, and I would ask Delilah Donaldson, the Manager of Human Relations Department, and Constance, I see Constance here, Nick. National Improvement Services Department. Constance? Okay. Whereas April marks the anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which sought to eliminate discrimination in housing opportunities and to affirmatively further housing choices for all Americans, whereas the ongoing struggle for dignity and housing opportunity continues to be an issue and vigorous local efforts must continue to combat discrimination, whereas the Durham City Council has authorized the Human Relations Division of the Neighborhood Improvement Services Department to take necessary action to enforce the city's fair housing ordinance and the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968 as amended, Whereas ongoing fair housing education, outreach, and monitoring is the key to raising awareness of a person's fair housing rights and responsibilities. Whereas only through commitment, continued cooperation, and full support from the Durham community can the barriers to fair housing be removed. And therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the month of April as Fair Housing Month in the City of Durham and urge all citizens to take special notice of observance and assist in promoting good fair housing practices throughout the City of Durham. Witness my hand, Corporate Civil City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the seventh day of April, 2014. Present this to Mr. Donaldson. And uh, thank you, Mary Bell. And I would like to call up our Vice Chair of the Human Relations Commission also. And is Kurt West present? I'd like to call him up. He is uh, the President of the Durham Regional Association of Realtors. And each April, uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, recognizes Fair Housing Month in April. And this law recognizes and marks the passage of the 1968 Fair Housing Act. This is the landmark law passed shortly after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The law prohibits housing discrimination based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, and families with children. And the City of Durham Human Relations Division is the agency that's the local agency where persons can come and file complaints if they feel they've been discriminated against on behalf of any of those bases. Each year, the City's Human Relations Division plans activities designed to enhance the public's awareness and knowledge of their fair housing rights. This year's theme, the 2014 Fair Housing Month theme is Fair Housing is Your Right, Use It. And some of the activities that we are having uh, this year, the ones that are open to the public, I will give you the dates and as you leave out, you can feel free to pick up a copy of this flyer too with the details. Uh, the next, uh, on April the 12th, which is um, Saturday, April the 12th, actually we have two events. Uh, one of them will be the first annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Good Neighbor Breakfast. And we will partner with several organizations. We have our Human Relations Division, Human Relations, of course, our agency, the Commission, the Durham Martin Luther King Steering Committee, and the Durham Congregations in Action. This is Saturday, April 12th, 11 o'clock to 12.30, and it will be held at the First Presbyterian Church, which is here downtown Durham. And, we, and this is uh, open to the public, and they're asking for an $8 donation for that. The other event where we will have a fair housing outreach table will be the Bull City Play Streets event, 
Uh, we'll have an outreach booth there with promotional items and information. Please uh, stop by and, and partake of those activities. This is Saturday, April the 12th. It will start at 9 o'clock and go through 2 o'clock p.m. And it will, um, they will start congregating at W.G. W. Pearson Elementary School. And this is on Fayetteville Street. Uh, the next uh, event, this is also open to the public, we have a bilingual fair housing training that will take place at Eagle Point Apartments. This will take place on Thursday, April the 17th from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, it will be in Spanish and English. And Eagle Point Apartments is, is, um, is located on 412 East Pallet Street. The next event is the Fair Housing and Sustainability Conference sponsored by our division, the Fair Housing Project, Legal Aid of, of North Carolina, the North Carolina Justice Center, and the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. This will take place Thursday, April 24th at the Cotton Room from 8.30 to 12.30 p.m. The Cotton Room is located at 807 East Main Street, Building 2. So you're invited to all of these events that are open to the public. You will have to register for the Fair Housing and Sustainability Conference. You will have to register for that online. Uh, the Fair Housing Education Day will take place at W.G. Pearson Elementary School also, but this will be uh, activities, diversity, discrimination, activities that will take place with the fifth grade class there. We will teach them about fair housing, they will do other activities, and uh, W.G. Pearson is located on Fayetteville Street. This is not open to the public, it's open only to those fifth graders that are participating, but anyway but it will be Fair Housing Education Day, and that will be Monday, April 28th, 2014. So um, those are the activities I will leave for those of you that are here. If you would like to get your own copy, it will be located in the back of the room. And uh, here again, on behalf of the Human Relations Division, the Human Relations Commission, and the Neighborhood Improvement Services Department, we thank you for this proclamation. And next, I would like to introduce Kirk, uh, West, and he is the president of the Durham Regional Association of Realtors. He wants to talk about fair housing also. Thank you. Okay. As president of the Durham Regional Association of Realtors, we join the city of Durham in celebrating April as Fair Housing Month. Members of DRAR support the Fair Housing Act to affirm the right of every citizen to obtain the housing of their choice without being limited by race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, or familiar status. We celebrate the Fair Housing Month and the strength that diversity brings to our communities and nation. We pledge to work in partnership with HUD and other housing related organizations to eliminate discrimination in our communities. Thank you. The last recognition we have this evening is for National Public Safety 911 Communications Officers Week. And we'd ask Ms. Sharon Carson, Durham Emergency Communications Employee of the Year. And I, no, I know where she is. In fact, I'm going to let you do it since you're the manager. Why don't you do this? Thank you. Jim Sukup, Director of Emergency Communications. Um, National Public Safety 911 Communications Officer Week is observed across the nation the week of April 13th through the 19th. In honor of the occasion, uh, the Durham City Council will be issuing the following proclamation, and the proclamation reads, whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services, and whereas when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police officers, firefighters, and paramedics is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property and whereas the safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the Durham Emergency Communications Center and whereas the public safety communications officers are the first and the most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services. Whereas public safety communications officers are the single vital link 
for our police officers, firefighters, and paramedics by monitoring their activities by radio and providing them information and ensuring their safety. And whereas the public safety communications officers of the Durham Emergency Communication Center have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and the treatment of patients. And whereas each dispatcher has exhibited compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job in the past year. It is proclaimed the week of April 13th through the 19th, 2014, as National Public Safety 911 Communications Officers Week. It is my uh, pleasure and my honor to, uh, to have this person who had received a proclamation from our Durham Emergency Communications Center as our recently announced Employee of the Year. This individual has demonstrated over the past 12 months exceptional customer service to the citizens of Durham and the extraordinary ability to maintain composure in tense situations. Her job knowledge is outstanding and one of the best and exemplified in her achieving the highest score in the department's end of year's testing examination. It is my honor to present this proclamation to the Durham Emergency Communications Employee of the Year Ms. Shannon Carson. It is a privilege to be here tonight and to represent the Durham Emergency Communication Center. It is an organization that strives for greatness and excellence. And we set the highest standards for our employees. So to be one of them is truly a pleasure and it makes me very proud to serve the citizens of Durham. And again, thank you for this honor. Dr. Allison, don't leave yet. I'm not sure the mayor is registered to vote. Let me ask first, are there any comments by members of the council? If not, uh, I recognize the city manager for any priority items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. Likewise, the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. On agenda item number 12, proposed sale of air rights easement at 106 West Main Street. Um, this is uh, to Empress Development uh, LLC. Based in part on the conversation that I had with you all at the work session, I'd like to replace both A and B in the motion, uh, and the motion simply read, to authorize the city manager to execute in return for $2,400 paid by Empress Development LLC, an agreement granting the legal rights necessary to install windows in the east wall of the building at 112 West Main Street. Uh, this will allow us to, to effectuate the proper legal document um, to to, to make this particular uh, request uh, occur. And I think if, if, that's, if that's voted on, uh, you can read that into the um, item number 12 since it's already on consent. I entertain a motion on the city attorney's prior item. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. I would ask for their prior items by the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda as printed, consent agenda item. Coming first, if uh, a member of the council and a member of the public 
ask for a consent agenda item to be removed. Uh, we will remove it and discuss it later in the meeting. Uh, read the high heading of each one. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is the Durham Performing Arts Center Oversight Committee appointment. Item three is the Mayor's Appointees, Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau Tourism Development Authority. Item four is the Board's commission, Committees and Commission Attendance Reports for the period January 1, 2013 through December 31, 2013. Item four is use of social media performance audit February 2014. Item six is FY 2014-2015 budget development guidelines. Pull item number six. Item number seven is the third amendment to contract for emergency solutions grant and dedicated housing fund rapid rehousing services with housing for New Hope. Someone pull that? Yes. Um, Item number eight is location change for public art project grant number grant for Brenda Miller Homes. Item number nine is acceptance of the donation of a sculpture for CCP Plaza. Item 11 is bid report January 2014. Item 12 is proposed sale of air rights easement at 106 West Main Street, parcel number 10. 2776 to Empress Development LLC. Item 13 is amendment to grant project ordinance number 14548 HUD Fair Housing Grant. Item 14 is intergovernmental agreement with the U.S. Geological Survey for operation and maintenance of the City of Durham Rainfall and Stream Flow Network FY 2015. Item 15 is a contract amendment increasing 2013 street repaving project. ST-265. Item 16 is U-0071 East End Connector Agreements with North Carolina Department of Transportation. <coughs> Item, that, that concludes the consent agenda items. I entertain a motion for the approval of consent agenda with, with the exceptions of item 6, 7, and 12. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? I'm trying to vote. Uh, can, you, can you do it again? My button isn't working. Okay, open the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We move to the general business agenda for pu public hearings. Item 18 is consolidated annexation item for Chapel Creek. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young with the planning department. I can first certify for the record that this public hearing item was properly advertised in accordance with the provisions of law and there are there's an affidavit to that effect on file with the planning department. Um, the item before you is the coordinated annexation item associated with the proposed Chapel Creek development. It's located on 17.1 acres at George King Road and Crossland Drive, uh, just north of NC Highway 54. There are three uh, associated items that are before you um, tonight. The first is utility extension agreement, which would allow the applicant to serve the development with city water and sewer service. The uh, public works and water management departments have conducted a utility impact analysis and determined that water and sewer uh, facilities and infrastructure are adequate to serve this site. The second is a voluntary petition for annexation submitted by the property owners. Uh, it's case BDG 13-10. The Budget Management Services Department performed a fiscal impact analysis based on the most intense uses permitted within the proposed uh, zoning designation. And the analysis they completed uh, estimated that revenues would exceed estimated expenditures by the city uh, immediately following annexation. The third portion of the request is initial zoning, KC 13-14. Uh, it's the requested initial zoning of a PDR, Planned Development Residential 8.00, which would allow up to 105 multifamily or single-family residential units on the site. and includes a number of text and graphic commitments, which are outlined in the staff report uh, that's included in your agenda package. The request is consistent with the comprehensive land use plan. Based on the uh, reviews I just uh, outlined, the staff recommends uh, approval of the extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning for Chapel Creek, 
At their February 11, 2014 meeting, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the initial zoning by a vote of 12 to 0. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. This is a public hearing. You've heard the staff report on this item. I would ask first, are there questions or comments by members of the council on the staff report? Hearing none, we have three persons that have signed up to speak on this item. Uh, I would ask is that anyone else that wants to speak, I have Lynn Scott, Chris Selby, and Gerard Edens. Is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item, either for or against? If not, recognize uh, Lynn Scott, Chris Selby, and Gerard Edens in that order. If you can come to the podium to my right. And uh, you each have three minutes uh, each on the item. Um, I'm Lynn Scott. Good evening, Durham City Council members. I'm a new resident of Durham. I moved there in August of this year, and I'm delighted to be part of Eastwood Park. It's a wonderful neighborhood, and I'm here to advocate tonight for the developer because I think their plans to um, enlarge our neighborhood are really nice. Um, Eastwood Park is a lovely neighborhood that's very treed and borders on the um, Army Corps of Engineers waterfowl containment area, <laughs> as my son says, the duck prison. <laughs> and it's really lovely. One thing that I've noticed living there is um, it's an area that needs well controlled because it's loaded with water. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Um, so I think the, the recommendation of eight units per house or per acre is a good one. Um, and the only other thing I would add is I did some research on David Weekly um, Builders, and I just wanted to say they're an excellent company, and I think having good companies be a part of Durham is a good long-range plan, and I'd love to see them be one of the first people that adds to this community. Um, if you didn't know, um, they are rated as the number 13 in the Fortune's best companies to work for, um, and they match college scholarships for their employees up to $2,000 for four years, so they invest back in the people that work for them, so they'll bring employment to the area as well, so I think it's a win for everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next is Gerard Eden. Thank you, Mayor, for this opportunity to speak. I'm Chris Selby. I live at 138 Celeste Circle in the Eastwood Park neighborhood, <clears throat> and uh, my property abuts Chapel Creek. The, the NC 54 I-40 corridor study report recommends that Eastwood Park remain a residential area with single-family homes for the long term and recommends measures to preserve and protect Eastwood Park. I uh, I expect to reside there for a long time, and I am enthusiastic about living on the periphery of a vibrant Lee Village with a light rail line. Chapel Creek is located between Eastwood Park and the planned Lee Village. I support the rezoning of Chapel Creek at the currently planned density of no more than eight units per acre. This density is consistent with the future land use map and Durham's comprehensive plan and it is appropriate for several reasons, which I communicated in detail to the, to the city council members by email. To summarize these main reasons, the Chapel Creek parcel is small and narrow. Continued increases in density from eight units to acre per acre in successive narrow parcels towards the Lee Village core will allow the ultimate density of Lee Village to be high enough to be successful as a transit node. Secondly, it seems prudent to limit the amount of impervious service in this environmentally sensitive area. Finally, higher density would be out of scale and inappropriate located uh, adjacent to Eastwood Park. Our neighborhood has demonstrated an interest in preserving and protecting our community for the long run, as indicated by, among other things, the corridor study recommendations and it seems appropriate that our interests be considered in this development of Crap Chapel Creek. Thank you. You're welcome. And now, Gerard Evan Edens? Jared. Jared Edens, okay, sorry about that. 
Uh, no, it's Jared, I guess, with me. Good evening. Uh, Jared Edens with uh, Edens Land Corp. Probably shouldn't say this. I feel guilty about. I'll feel guilty about billing my clients for my time tonight because our neighbors have done such a good job of presenting our project. Um, but I'm still going to bill you. <laughs> just you know. uh, Anyways, um, just I'm just going to make a few points, uh, and I appreciate our neighbors coming out. Um, as Pat mentioned, we we're at eight units an acre. We're consistent with the not only the land use plan but the Highway 54 corridor study. Uh, we had to up the density um, due to some feedback from staff and planning commission to uh, better support the rail station. We are keeping the single family portion of the project adjacent to the existing single family homes on Celeste Circle and we have pushed the multifamily as, as far away from that section as we can. Um, this should provide a good transition as you get closer to the rail station. I uh, do want to make uh, one proffer this evening. Uh, I see from the staff report uh, the rezoning results in 26 additional students of the Durham school system. Uh, my clients are offering to contribute $13,000 to Durham Public Schools. That's $500 per student. And this payment will be made prior to the first final plat for this project. And that's all I have. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of the developer's representative? Uh, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? This has been a public hearing. Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I would require the public hearing to be closed. I'm asking the Foot Council. Second. Okay, I've got a first and a second in discussion. Is that Councilman Sewell? Just briefly, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you for the proffer for the schools. I appreciate that. Uh, that's a good thing to do. Uh, I did have one question for. Uh, you know, the one thing that I don't, again, I'm, I'm totally in favor of this, but I, um, just in the long term, this just is adding and we're continuing to add traffic to 54. And what is the, uh, just briefly, Pat, when does 54 ever get fixed or semi-fixed or, you know, is there something that happens that triggers a change there that, it's obviously not this development, but just as you think, as you all think this through and look ahead. Thank you, Councilman Schul, Pat Young. Um, I'll let Bill Judge with Transportation elaborate on that. I'll, I'll give a brief answer. Um, I think one of the reasons you're seeing this project before you, something at this relatively modest scale, maximum of 105 units, is they didn't trip, tr trigger the threshold that requires a transportation impact analysis, and usually that means offsite improvements to 54. Um, I think what you, what you are likely to see is only smaller projects um, that don't trip that threshold until there's able to be significant improvements, uh, such as grade separation and, and widening. Uh, I'll let Mr. Judge elaborate on whether uh, where he sees that at in terms of uh, priorities and financing in the future. Yeah, Bill Judge with transportation. Um, yeah, as Mr. Young indicated, the uh, prioritization would be through future state uh, NCDOT TIP projects, through the MPO and the um, TAC and the. Um, TCC. Uh, right now the state's prioritizing projects statewide. The first step in this whole corridor was really the I-40 NC-54 corridor study that came out with a number of recommendations and so some of those recommendations, actually the first steps of those recommendations are in this prioritization process so um, we hope and expect that this corridor will score well but ultimately it'll be It'll have to compete statewide, and uh, or I guess this will be a regional for NC-54. Any other questions, comments? If not, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Uh, we now move back to the consent agenda. And Councilman Schultz, if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to take your item last because we have seven people. Uh, the item has been... Item 12 has been approved when we did the priority items for the city attorney. Uh, so item 7 is the item that was pulled, and we have several people that have signed up to speak for that. Uh, I didn't know if the mayor pro tem had. Yeah, you, you uh, might recall that there was a request uh, for us to suspend the rules and vote on this item at uh, the work session. And I was opposed to that because I thought it was unfair to to do that without uh, public comment uh, and the need for transparency, transparency in the allocation of 
of housing, um, rapid rehousing services. Clearly, complaints have been voiced in the past, and it was just unfair, I thought, to pass it without others having an opportunity to um, comment it on it. So I'm glad the folk came out tonight to do so. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I'm going to recognize the persons that have signed up to speak on this item. And if you come to the podium to the right, uh, you each have three minutes. Uh, first is Dr. Sharon Elliott Bynum, followed by Kelly Finner, followed by Daryl P. Hickam, and Carolyn Hinton, I think. Now, is anyone else that had wanted to pull this item or didn't pull this item? If not, recognize Dr. Bynum. Good evening, Mayor Bell, um, City Manager Bonfield, and Mayor Pro Tem, and the other council members. Um, my name is Sharon Elliott Bynum, and I reside at 105 Chancellor's Ridge uh, here in Durham, North Carolina. As you recall, um, I was here a couple of months ago to express my concern with process and how funds were equitably distributed for housing and um, more importantly, rapid rehousing. And what I think I wasn't aware of is that maybe people didn't know that other people did provide rapid, rapid rehousing for citizens of Durham. So um, I am saying tonight that Healing with Care has provided transitional housing for homeless veterans since 1999. So we are not new to the housing business. Since 2012, we were awarded funding from the state of North Carolina for 2013 to provide rapid rehousing. We successfully provided rapid rehousing to 42 citizens who were formerly ho homeless. And what I would like to do now is to yield the rest of my time to my colleagues so they can speak specifically to the role of rapid rehousing and what we were able to do in the process. Doctor, you, you probably on whatever our procedures. We, we don't yield time if persons are signed up to speak. They can speak. Uh, is Daryl Hickam one of the persons? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Daryl, you have three minutes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daryl P. Hicklin. <laughs> As you know that, um, I just want to give you an example of a veteran that we've been able to help through rapid rehousing. Example, cancer, he has had cancer, is currently going through chemo treatment, homeless, chose not to go in the shelter, sleeps in his car, does not have an honorable discharge. His discharge is up for appeal but received services from the Durham VA so graciously. Secondly, this veteran does not have good credit. We've been told his credit is fair. He does have a criminal record, but nothing major, minor stuff that kept him from going into other housing opportunities. We've, helped, we've provided this gentleman with food stamps, helped him navigate the food stamp process. He's not the best at even filling out applications, but his pride by being a veteran meant that he wanted to, didn't want to live here, he wanted to live there, he wanted his own. Just living in his car alone, we had some very cold nights. He called and he came over to CARE, we provided him with food through the shelter that we have there at CARE. Through rapid rehousing, we were able to help him with a utility deposit. We were able to help him with his housing deposit. We were able to help him with food. We were able to help him with shoes because his shoes were worn. Pride, a veteran that had all the pride in the world who served this country faithfully through little things and he had some cognitive issues. Just imagine this person. Where does he fit in the gap? Where, does it, where would this person be served? Healing with Care made that decision in conjunction with a, a USA Veterans Health. 
we work together. This could have been your relative. This was possibly, easily could have been one of my relatives. Where would we in Durham to have served this person? And yes, he does, he is in that poverty, poverty line. So as of right now today, this gentleman has his own apartment, he's cooking his own food, and he, his chest is stuck out proudly because he is a, one of our proud citizens of Durham, North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Fenner. Hello, Mayor Bill and council members. My name is Kelly Fenner and I am a housing specialist slash case manager working with Rapid Rehousing Program at Healing with Care Incorporated. Most people have little to no knowledge of the intensity of this program and the duties that comes along with transitioning an individual from homelessness to permanent or semi-permanent affordable housing. I find myself working long hours daily to meet the needs of our consumers. We accept participants who meet the homeless definition by HUD, have income, and are a Durham County resident. At Care Incorporated, we believe in a holistic approach in meeting the consumer where they are. This includes working with individuals who may have health issues and or disabilities, mental health and or substance abuse issues. Working with individuals who are duly diagnosed increases the amount of time that you are working with each consumer. Our job is to advocate for these consumers and try our best to place them into safe, affordable housing. The clients that we serve are considered the underserved population here in Durham County. Most of these individuals average income of $700 a month, have bad credit, and several inquiries on their criminal background, which makes it extremely difficult for a landlord to prove their application. Most of our participants use this data as their primary source of transportation. When searching for housing, you have to go to the landlord, pay to check out the key, then travel into the community to look at potential housing placements. When traveling on the bus line, this makes it difficult for homeless individuals who are in need of immediate housing. We are literally taking these consumers out on a daily basis, utilizing the agency's van to search for housing. We take these consumers through a mandatory training which teaches them how to budget and responsibilities as a tenant. We complete a thorough assessment with each consumer to assess their needs to the best of our ability. Most of these individuals are grade level educated, which means they are literacy deficit, which makes our jobs as housing specialists slash case managers more difficult. Additional duties include us having to walk them through tasks such as setting up a Duke Energy account, other utilities assisting them with lease filling out, lease agreements, et cetera. The contract grant is designed, is designed that funding primarily goes to housing the homeless individual without the consideration of providing much funding for the case managers, excuse me, that are doing all the work to get these individuals off the street and back into society as productive citizens. I am standing here today on behalf of Healing with Care to advocate for funding for the Rapid Rehousing Program and to be recognized for the work that we're doing in the community. Thank you. You're welcome. Carolyn Hinton, is that correct? <coughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Carolyn Hinton. Don't wanna to speak too loudly. Mayor Bell and members of the council, um, I'm trying to um, advocate for our housing program to continue to be able to do it and to receive funding. And the way that I'm approaching it is to give you three candidates that we assisted in this past six months. The first candidate was a veteran who was living at the homeless shelter. He had come with service-connected uh, disability. He had a history of substance abuse, but he had a strong desire to have independent living. So what did he do? He applied for housing. 
He attended our training. He assisted in looking for adequate housing for himself. And he followed all of the directions that we gave him. We developed long and short term goals. He is now currently in his home and having no problems managing his household. A, a good success story. The next candidate was a young single female, 24 years old. What was interesting about this young lady when she came in, um, she admitted to me that she had been living in a car. You see, she had expended all of her resources from her family and others, so she didn't have any resources or help. She was chronically homeless from the age 16 up to age 24, but she had a job, and she had sustained that job for the past six months. She admitted that previously she did not have a substantial work history. We looked at her credit record, we looked at her criminal record, and none of the landlords could, would have independently assisted her. But we managed to talk to them to give her an opportunity to have an apartment, and she is doing fine. She's working at a fast food restaurant and takes seriously the responsibility of managing her household. The last final candidate I want to uh, acquaint you with is, was a middle-aged female. Now, three strikes against you. She was chronically homeless, in and out of the shelter, living in a car, and she faced a chronic illness. She had limited income, and we mentioned before, most of these have incomes less than $700 a month we were able to help her obtain a lease. So please help us to continue to help people like this who have no advocates. Thank you. Uh, that completes all the persons that had signed up to, to speak on this item. Uh, Madison, now back before the council and uh, entertain comments that we have on this. Oh. Um, you, you have a comment, Mayor Pratt? Yes, sir. I, at the work session, it was noted that uh, the majority of the council was going to go on and vote for this item. However, I think it is important that you share the stories that you did. What has happened is that the system, and I, I should have caught this earlier, we have set this system up so that there was no opportunity for anyone else to get money. Uh, because of the amendments. And so in the future, we need to be more careful in looking at process, as you said, so that we, other folk who can do the same kind of work, are not denied the opportunity to do so. So I apologize to you for not catching this earlier, but I assure you that I will be looking very closely in the future. Thank you for coming. Other recognized Councilwoman Katati and Councilman Shule in that order. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a few questions, but I guess I'll start with staff because we had a good amount of discussion at the work session about this, and I do appreciate um, the services uh, provided by Healing with Care and, of course, Housing for New Hope. So my understanding was this was FY14, like the current year's funding of 200000 in a, the housing penny and 67000 in ESG funds for FY14, the upcoming year, no new funds. This was a contract extension. Can you clarify when, um, when the period of, I'll call it the open um, solicitation period for ESG funds? I'm thinking, well, I'll just stop and let you answer okay. that. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Bell, Mayor Bell, members of council, Larry Jarvis, Department of Community Development. The funds that we are uh, recommending that we add are 13-14 funds, FY 13-14 funds. Can I just ask, because yes. I'm still confused by this, if you would just use a single year, either calendar year, but say FY 14 or FY 15, we're going into FY 15, and when we talk in a minute about budget guidance, that's FY 15, mm, the current right. year is FY 14. So we're adding so when you FY do 14. 13 and 14, I get we're confused. We're adding 14, okay, yes. And we had, um, 
the open process for requesting 15 funds last fall, we had an application workshop. We advertised the availability of the funds, again, in the Herald Sun and the Carolina Times. There was a notice of the workshop posted on our website. Uh, people were notified by, by way of listserv. Uh, and once again, for 15 funds for next year, Housing for New Hope was the only applicant for the funds. And when do you anticipate the next go round of the same process? Uh, again, next fall. Uh, we would have the same type of competitive process. Uh, we will go above and beyond the steps we've taken in the past to make sure that organizations are aware of the opportunity. Um, if necessary, as Mayor Pro Tem had suggested at the work session, if we need to pick up the phone and call people to make sure that they're aware of the opportunity and the process for applying for funds, then that's what we'll do. Recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to clarify then, Mr. Jarvis, so uh, when you say next fall, you're talking six months from now, roughly, or? Correct. So, okay, so just to say to Dr. Elliot Bynum, that's a target to keep in mind. Um, and uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll be contacted, but it's always good to be aware as well. Um, and uh, I'm, I just want to make clear, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very supportive of Housing for New Hope and the work that they do. Uh, and also, uh, I think that uh, the work that you all do down there at CARE is wonderful as well. Uh, we have, we're lucky to have great organizations here in this town. And uh, thank, it, was a, it was good for me to hear some of these details, and I really appreciated uh, hearing these. Uh, and I, to, I know a lot of the work that you do with veterans and with the health care and so forth, but I really wasn't aware of some of these uh, situations and the work that you do with them. So it was really enlightening, and I want to thank uh, our Mayor Pro Tem for, uh, for bringing that to our attention. Uh, but thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Jarvis. Thank you. Are there other questions? Recognize Councilman Brown. Yeah. I want to echo what my colleagues have said. And Dr. Vine, thanks the four of you for coming uh, here this evening. Uh, it was certainly enlightening for me. And part of what you're doing is, as you pointed out, is sort of filling the void, uh, particularly for our veterans, which I think is absolutely crucial. Um, and I don't know how it happened that somehow you were not notified or were not cognizant of uh, the enrollment process and the work session, uh, but perhaps, not perhaps, I know that in the future you will be, but I also know that uh, Housing for New Hope has an excellent track record, and that's why I will be supporting them this evening. But again, thanks so much for coming. Any other com recognize Councilman Davis? Um, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm interested in why um, healing with care has not applied for funds for the next fiscal year. Biden, you care to answer that? Um, thank you so much for that question. We did apply um, for $108,000 to rehab a facility for homeless veteran women and um, we were in competition with three other individuals. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the same um, application that Housing for New Hope um, and the Housing Authority and one other individual applied. And if I'm not mistaken, um, Housing for New Hope applied for their streets to home, which is their rapid rehousing. So I. I'm certain that's where the funding was, but we were applying for permanent supportive housing for female veterans, and we were told by um, the, the department that there wasn't really a real need for female veterans, and so we then bought some data back saying here are the numbers 
for homeless female veterans because we are seeing those individuals and they're coming to us and they're identifying themselves. So we did apply for $108,000. The funds that we're doing um, rapid rehousing right now with are state funds only. If I could just yes. clarify the, the funds that Healing for, with, for Care did request were continuum of care funds. That is a separate application process. We have a, a workshop for the dedicated funding source for our CWG funds, the home funds, our emergency solutions grant funds. And that is a totally separate process from continuum of care funds. It's Councilman Davis' question, and if you had any further um, comments. Yes, I'm, I'm satisfied. Okay. Recognize before Steve, uh, I thought Councilman Moffitt had raised his hand. Okay. I asked this at the work session, but I'm back in the same position of going, can you explain the dates again? Just the, the dates of the contract and the fiscal year funding, because I, I noticed it said through, through June 2015. Right. The initial funding was 13 funding that was awarded to Housing for New Hope. And that was both the ESG funds and the dedicated housing funds. That contract was not actually executed until February of 2013. So they had those funds for a year. The way that contract was set up, subject to satisfactory performance, that we would then extend the term of that contract for one more year and add the 14 funds to it. So the outside date for the extension would be June of 2015, but as we indicated at work session, uh, given the pace of spending and the level of service that Housing for New Hope um, has been providing, most likely they will um, complete um, this contract amendment well before June of 2015. And, and the funding for this extension is in fiscal year 14. 14. Thank you. Yes. Is that it? I recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, just to make sure I understand and Dr. Elliot Bynum understands, uh, I'm going to say this. Larry, and if I'm wrong, you can set me straight. Uh, so as we talked about after the continuum of care, uh, after you all didn't get that money, when we talked, so the, the contract tonight has some uh, ESG money, some federal money in it, but it also has the, some local dollars, $200,000 in, in general fund money. And so we're really talking about two separate application processes for the future, just to keep that in mind. One is for the various streams of federal money, which was what your 108,000 was for. And then the other will be the possibility of using um, our penny for housing, our dedicated funding source. So just, I know we've talked about that, but just wanted to say that again, and just make sure I'm right in front of our staff person. Is that, is that correct? We advertise the availability of dedicated housing funds or general funds in conjunction with our entitlement funds. So, so it is that, one application process, but that process is separate from the continuum of care. Got it. Okay. Process. Yeah. Okay. And um, I know you'll be available if they have any other questions about that. Yes. Thank you. Recognize the mayor pro tem. Uh, it's just uh, very clear that getting money is sort of complex, and it should not be that complex, especially with the penny for housing, which we all pay taxes to fund. So I suggest that we demystify the way we fund and take whatever steps necessary to make sure that there's clarity in how we allocate funds so that there is not a perception that people are being left out. And that is a perception. I've heard that from several agencies. So please, we have got to do something to demystify <laughs> how, I mean, we need to help people who are helping people. And it's, it shouldn't be this complex. It should not be this complex. Thank you. Any other comments, discussion on this item? 
If not the items before us, so I entertain a motion on item. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, we move now to the last item of the pool and recognize Councilman Shule. This is item uh, six. Mr. Mayor, um, this is regarding the budget guidelines and um, we left the work session uh, without a, a budget guideline regarding parks and I felt it was, there was a majority of the council was continued to be interested in this funding and wanted to see, uh, uh, w w I'm hoping that the council will support this uh, language that I have put in front of you, uh, I, get, I, th I think that I've given it to all my council colleagues. Give it a copy to the city manager as well. Uh, as, a, as a budget guideline, I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I'd be happy to, to talk about it, but uh, the, the basic idea being that uh, not more that this, the funding level for the maintenance and renovation of parks and trails would not exceed. Uh, uh, 0.50 cents per hundred dollars of assessed value, uh, and that we're asking the staff to give us a couple of different levels of funding so that we can see something between zero and 0 0.50 cents and make a decision when budget time actually comes as to whether or not we want to spend that money. So uh, I'd be happy to make a motion at the appropriate time, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I would entertain the motion, but I, I'd like to have, uh, I'd like to make some comments on this. Uh, my, my, my position relative to funding of parks and recreation centers has not changed from the start of this process. Uh, I have always been an advocate for maintaining the properties that we have before we talk about expanding uh, the funding for parks and rec. Uh, my mind hasn't changed on that. Uh, when this idea of penny for parks was first introduced, I don't think that was very clear among the general population as to how the one cents would be spent if it were uh, at, or, uh, supported by the council. Uh, some people talked about expansions. Uh, some talk, people talk about buying land and land banking it, uh, a variety of things, and none of those that I support. I still think that maintenance has a, should be a high priority for the properties that we have. Uh, I'm not wedded to a uh, half cents, a quarter cents, or uh, any particular number, except when we had a discussion at the last work session, it was pretty clear to me that we were far below what we would recognize as a meanable funding source for maintenance. Uh, I, I, I don't have a problem with, you know, one cents uh, if it gets us closer to where we are in terms of the maintenance uh, requirements. But before I even go there, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have a problem amending your recommendation from a half cents up to one cents uh, with, the, with the staff coming back with the same type of information as to how it will be spent. And it, ultimately, the council may decide on one cents, may decide on half cents, but it gives, a, gives us, at least puts us in a better position to really get into the maintenance funding that we need for parks. But even before I could support any amount, I want some additional information to come back from the staff, Mr. Manager. I, I like us to look, I like the staff to look at our five largest cities, uh, Charlotte, Raleigh, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and of course Durham. And I like to add also the city of Cary and the city of Chapel Hill since they are the major cities within the re region. I'd like to know what is their present tax rate for each one of those cities. I would like to know what fees and services do those cities charge for things like solid waste and et cetera, whatever they're charging for. Uh, and I, I, wanted, I wanted to be clear to the general public with respect to solid waste that uh, we're already supporting solid waste. And I think if I remember, it's almost 60 or 7%. I, I'm not sure, but you can come back and tell us what, what that number is. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd like to have that information as we go into the budget discussion. And as I said, I don't have a problem with, for discussion purposes, to raising that half cents to one cents because it gets us closer to what the uh, staff has said it would be. 
but I still would like, what, no matter what it is, to come back and tell us what type of maintenance are we speaking about? What's going to be maintained? Where are we going to step up the, the efforts? Is it and more people maintaining the buildings? Is it more people mowing the lawns? Just where is that is that money going to be spent? And I like to know what are other cities spending? Those major cities that we just spoke about, uh, what are they spending in terms of maintaining their parks and recreation centers? And if you can find out how much are they spending for maintenance of those facilities, and if in fact it's all being done through the same source of revenue that we have, which is basically the property tax and fees and services, and of course any kind of grants that, that we might get that goes towards that. But I, for me, I, I'll be in a better position to really weigh the pros and cons and speak about uh, what I personally, not the council, what I personally uh, feel comfortable in supporting with respect to parks and rec. But in no cases would I, would I support a budget that's going to take any about amount of increase to increase property or buildings or what have you if we're going to talk about maintenance. And the maintenance, I know we've got a part of the maintenance that's coming out of uh, parks and recs and another coming out of uh, general services, but it's still a dollar amount that uh, is coming from the taxpayers. So I'd I like to know what that is. So Steve, what I'm saying to you, to your motion, I don't have a problem in raising this to one cents. Uh, providing that that, that suits me fine, Mr. Mayor. I would like that. Thank I you. The other pieces there. I rec recognize, recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I have to admit that I do have problems with uh, raising money for. <laughs> do I need two of these? So <laughs> you, you can turn you as officer. <laughs> I, I am. I am really interested in. Uh, protection of our assets and and unless I'm comfortable that there can be some sort of policing uh, of our of our parks somehow I've, I've noticed how uh, I see police cars parked at businesses um, uh, very often and I think it's important that uh, if we um, raise raise uh, tax for this purpose that we need to make sure that this, our assets are, are protected. Uh, secondly, I do have some reservation too because uh, the gap between the haves and the have nots continue to widen and uh, we have, um, I think we anticipate increases in water and sewer rates, um, stormwater rates, uh, and other uh, kinds of uh, things I believe so we need to be cognizant of the fact that there are so many people who don't have the resources that those of us around this uh, dais have. Thank you. I recognize Councilman Brown. Yeah, thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I concur with much of what you just articulated and I would also add that uh, you know, apparently at our last work session well, again I may be in the minority on this but uh, there appeared to be an agreement that uh, we should shift the one dollar and eighty five cents fee uh, for solid waste into a 0.4 cents tax increase and I think that all of this before we reach and I hope before we reach any final decision uh, should be discussed holistically uh, we had agreed at one time that uh, that relatively small amount was just that very small and I did uh, an investigation that demonstrated how the the poorest in Durham, those who need uh, the most housing assistance, would not be affected by this. Uh, so, I'd rather step back. I certainly concur with what uh, what Steve and you two, obviously, Mayor, want, and that's I want to see some numbers. I want to see where the money may or may not be spent, what the priorities are 
within the Parks and Rec Department, uh, we had a very didactic tour, four of us, uh, about two weeks ago, and well, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's absolutely no question about that. Uh, but the question is, uh, where is the money going to come from, and whatever, what are our top priorities within the Parks and Rec Department? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I ask Council Moffitt to have your hand Thank you. Um, Mr. Manager, in addition to um, what the mayor's asked for in terms of information, something I've been sort of turning over in my mind over the last few weeks is, a, is a, an aggregate number per capita for the various cities for both um, revenues and expenditures so that um, I think the mayor asked for them you sort of, you know, like what kind of fees do they charge for various purposes? But I'd like to see what's the total amount of money that Cary raises, for example, per capita compared to the other cities that we're talking about, including Durham. So I, I think that you could probably pretty easily do that. And uh, then, um, can, can um, I ask? Can I ask a question on that? Just sure, a clarification. Yes, uh, are we speaking about money raised through property taxes, sales taxes, fees and services? federal money, state money, well, I, I think I, I just want clarification for the staff and us in terms of what you're asking for. Yes, um, I'm, I'm primarily interested in the amount of money that we're raising from the citizens of, the, of each um, municipality. So that, I guess that would exclude state and federal grant money. Um, it's a little bit tricky, I guess, because state and federal grant money might require local matches. I don't really know, and you know, so local tax would be going that way. But I, I just want to see. I, I think, well, I don't know what it'll look like, so I don't know if it'll be useful or not. But I know that uh, we look at some cities and they charge, I don't know, twenty-five dollars um, or twelve dollars a month or something for solid waste pickup, and people want to point to them and say, look how low their taxes are. So I just want to see the total amount of money that each municipality is raising from their citizens and get a sense for that. The second thing is, is that um, I'll, I'll support the mayor's um, um, request to raise it to a penny because we're simply seeking information right now so we can actually make a cons um, an informed decision. And I, I'm not ready to, to do it, but I am ready to look at the information and I, I, I think the guidance for staff is really important so that we get the information we need. Thank you. Let me say that's, that's the purpose that I, I'm asking for that. I am committed to one sense. I ain't committed to anything yet, but I, I think if we have enough information that at least it'll help me in trying to decide uh, where, where I want to go. And uh, I just want to make sure I'm clear on this uh, solid waste fee. I, I haven't committed to switching from the fee to the tax fee, so I, that wasn't part of my discussion. I, I, I'm in a better position to make those kind of decisions once I've got this other information. That's why I want to know what are other mis municipalities charging? How, what is their revenue source for their solid, solid waste? Uh, that's, that's, that's what I, I'm trying to understand. Is it all property tax? Is it a combination of fees and services? Or just what is it? So, so I don't want anybody to go away to say I've committed to switching from the fee to six cents or whatever, point six cents or something like that. Uh, do we need a motion on this to, okay, Councilman Shuler. Uh I'm happy to make a motion, but uh, just wanted to say, I, I just want to say to all assembled that I realize I have lost my, um, my uh, effort to get new facilities for Parks and Rec in this budget. I, I know it is a six to one situation. Mr. Brown, I'm, I, I just want to go on record and say I'm no longer pushing for that this year. Uh, I wanted to also add that one of the things that uh, that uh, Eugene had discussed on our when we did uh, go out with Parks and Rec was the opportunity to perhaps repurpose some of our smaller parks, and that, that also could be part of this consideration. We okay. we apparently don't have uh, we, we have some some parks that are small and underused, uh, or maybe not even used, but we can't. They're federal. We got them from some federal grant or something, and it's not something we can give away or sell, but that they could be repurposed. And uh, so that I'm sure would uh, be part of the consideration as well. Uh, but I appreciate this uh, and I, I think it's a great thing to look at. And when we get it back, we can see how we all feel about uh, 
what the plan is and how much it costs. And uh, so I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. Do you want a motion now? Yeah, for the manager's direction. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Schill, I think it'd be appropriate to uh, a motion to amend the uh, uh, draft budget guidelines that are before you. Vote on that motion, okay. and then uh, ultimately then vote on the entirety of the uh, the budget guidelines. Okay. So, Mr. Mayor, I, I would move that we amend the draft budget guidelines to include uh, this. Uh, a dedicated funding source for the maintenance and renovation of parks and trails will be considered, comma, and staff will prepare a specific plan that can be addressed at different levels of funding, not to exceed one cent per $100 assessed value. And I have a copy of that for the, for the clerk. Second. It's been properly moved in a second. I assume that includes the Mayor Pro Tem's question about police security. Okay. I have no further discussion. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Okay. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Is there anything else that needs to come before the council tonight before we close? Adjourn. If not, it means adjourn at 8.43 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Mr.